<laughs> All right. So it's a beautiful day here in Wisconsin. Yeah. Perfect temperatures. Uh, pardon? Oh, let me get my earphones. Can I just a second? I can hear my. So, what's new? <laughs> Any, anything come up that we ought to? Well, we should introduce you to Elizabeth, who's on our call today. Um, Elizabeth's our newest staff person, and she's going to do our the Kansas organizing, where we have groups that are, we've kind of actually changed it a little bit. Um, and so our, our little cohorts that are in Kansas now meet for eight weeks learning ABCD. And then if you've gone through that eight week training, you become a candidate to do a year long um, where we work with you for a year and you can work up to five hours a week doing or ABCD organizing in your local community. So, which was totally the influence of Ruben Medina, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. It was like, you guys are, you got to go fewer people for a longer amount of time. And we took that. So, but Elizabeth, uh, you should say hello and introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah. So I um, recently graduated from um, Wichita State University with a psychology background um, in May. And so before neighboring movement, I was doing a lot of clinical psychology stuff like giving therapy, doing psychological assessments, um, teaching um, psychology courses, and then um, made the shift to make more of a community impact. Um, and then got connected with Lead for America, which is how I got connected then with the neighboring movement. And so I've been here since August, completely like officially. <laughs> Were you on a a discussion with me a little earlier this um, week? Not earlier this week. That may have been Maddie, actually. Maddie, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Ma Maddie is our faith-based organizer. Ah, okay. Thank We're basically you. just like hiring out all the important roles so that we don't screw them up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, is there is there something that we we had we had uh, sort of an agreement that if there are any of our people who would be useful, I would connect you to them, and uh, then that we would talk monthly. Is there anything where you see any of our people might be useful at this point? Don't have to, I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we're continuing to work with Ruben actually. Um, and we contracted with him then beyond just speaking to our one group, he actually did a co couple coaching sessions with Elizabeth mm. so that she can learn ABCD from a source outside of just us, you know? Yeah. Get that perspective, so. And I, Elizabeth, had, it seemed like it went well, yeah? Yeah, it went really good. Um, he helped me make that first, like, think of ABCD and how, like, how you can implement it here and um, thinking of it more of like, whenever we try to implement ABCD, how can we break cycles? Sorry, there's a siren. <laughs> um, so the biggest takeaway I would say from Ruben is um, he made a statement of like, work your way out of a business and like work yourself out of a business, basically meaning like when you implement something, um, don't have people relying on it, um, have people like grow beyond that. And then thinking of adding an economic development piece into that, um, which is basically like all about empowerment. Um, so that's been really helpful moving forward with the individuals who are doing community projects now and challenging as well. Cause I think 
making a project that does that successfully is really hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and we really with that kind of guidance then resh reshaped that program a little bit and now have um, three folks I think right is that true yeah. three now yep, three mm -hmm. three who signed on for that year long commitment uh -huh. to do uh, you know some projects in their local area and well it's 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 actually interesting one of them is two of them are doing something where they live and one of them is doing he's working with LGBT, lgbtq people in rural communities kind of a, through a, he had a Facebook group already that he was the administrator of and it had like 500 people in it but he had never considered using that group through an asset-based lens and so he's then creating that using ABCD in that community so rural rural LGBTQ people which there's actually quite a few yeah yeah when I think about uh, Ruben one of the things that uh, he has always said in the, when we have meetings is that uh, <clears throat> he has uh, been able to work with a broad spectrum of people because he is persistent. Did he talk with you about that, Elizabeth? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. He was talking about how like his role is really staying right by their side through throughout their whole, staying very closely connected with whatever he's helping organize. Um, and also that accountability piece he was sharing, which was really helpful to like what my role is. Cause at first it was kind of this understanding of not take, like letting them take control. But then when we got more into talking, it was more of like, you really have to push them and tell them like, ask them what's the concrete next step. Okay, you already did that what's next and then checking up on them um, and helping lead that and building a roadmap, roadmap. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why we're doing fewer people because that takes a lot more time on our end. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Elizabeth, along the way, of course, one of the things uh, here, let me put it in context uh, that I remember. Uh, when I was, the others of you may have heard this, but when I was a neighborhood organizer at the beginning, uh, I would meet uh, each uh, month, I mean, each week with a lead organizer. And the first time I got together with him, he said to me, okay, what didn't you do this week? I had been out there a week. And I said, I didn't know what I didn't do. And he said, the reason we're getting together is to find out what happened out there because you were there, but you didn't do it. And the kind of questions he's talking about, you're asking, are questions that are all focused on how can we end up with your doing it, not me, <laughs> right? So I, I think that's a good thing to constantly keep, keep in mind. <clears throat> Anytime you're the actual doer, you've gotten out of place, <laughs> right? Mm. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the getter other people to be doers. <laughs> And uh, I, I think that's uh, those questions and the way he's talking about acting it, it has to do with that understanding of who you are and, and uh, what your role is, right? John, have you found like any, um, like we've been kind of playing around with like making project plans mm -hmm. and, and like really just templates for accountability with folks? as far as like trying to get them to really name what they're going to do have you do you have any things that come to mind when you think of that well <clears throat> i mean one of the things this pushing that ruben's talking about is the 
get people to the action level, right? And mm-hmm. that, and to and that that action would be conceived by them, designed by them, and carried out by them, right? So uh, I would think that um, setting a date someplace ahead uh, so that it isn't interminable talk Mm -hmm. and that maybe even almost in your curriculum or in your, your, what, six months or 12 month activity do they have written in a time when the project begins <laughs> right? mm-hmm. so that they see that as both a goal and not something that is in infinity, right? So that would be uh, my thought. Setting goal times, I think, is a right important way of... Uh, in people uh, also um, I would think an organizer would be asking questions before you get started that always led you to get started <laughs> right that uh, you're, uh, you're raising the question about as to what they're thinking about, well, how would we carry that out so, so that they are having a planning experience in which they are thinking about action related to whatever they're talking about. And an organizer would have an important role in pre- constantly raising that question how would this apply to what we want to do? Does this apply for what we want to do? Maybe this isn't important. Maybe it is. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are the two, two things that I remember can think about setting time limit, then being being the nudger to the time limit, right? Constantly, this discussion is not something that is unrelated to action that we're going to do, right? You're you're inserting that kind of a role in into what's going on. Right? Um, what kinds of things have your churches tended to do? Well, these folks aren't churches. These are, this is our, this is not, this group is not faith-based. So okay. they, they're individuals in communities who do eight weeks of listening. And yeah. then if they f- discover a project, they can sign on for the longer term thing. But I'll let Elizabeth, you should share what they're up to. Yeah. So <clears throat> the three individuals who are moving forward into the community builder space, which is what we've called it. Um, One of them is working to build a community to help kind of launch a cultural festival at some point, um, because in her area, there's a lot of immigrants and refugees um, and they are not Um, included in the community as well or integrated as well. So there's no sense of community um, with with everyone there. And so right now she's in the phase of talking to organizations that specifically work with immigrants and refugees and who who already built a community um, specifically for that group um, and trying to gather individuals and get buy-in to participate in something like this. Um, but the big idea is that they'll come together and have kind of either sharing food or have booths where they can engage, engage and learn about each other um, and start building relationships that way. And then another individual, Bernice, she is um, also in an area with um, a huge Hispanic population. Um, 
and also is more specifically um, working on building a coalition of um, organizations and individuals um, who want like to support the, the families who are at this local school that are typically like needing extra services. Um, and so that one's been the most challenging right now um, because her original plan came from the needs perspective of her original plan was uh, making some kind of donation box um, to you know help families who are in need of coats or school supplies or this sort of thing. Um, so we've been transforming that into um, looking at it from the asset perspective. And so one step that we have done since then is look at organizations that are already doing this because we don't want to reinvent the wheel and then um, start uh, focusing on learning conversations to ask why, like figure out why these families are using these services and then start learning about gifts um, and skills and start implementing a way, figuring out a way that we can also include these community members and empower them instead of keep them keeping them there. So that one's been the most challenging for us to like brainstorm. Um, but yeah, right now we're in the step of gathering organizations that are already doing this and maybe figuring out why there's not a connection with the school that she has um, an interest in helping. couple of uh, thoughts. Um, when, whenever you're creating a coalition, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, the, the question is where is the, where's the power in that coalition? What, what's, mm -hmm. what's the heavyweight piece of it? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> because coalitions are, can be very varied and depending on who's there, who, who's a part of it, often determines who has the loudest voice. And uh, so I know with ABCD <laughs> training, you, you, you're aware of this, but as I listen to coalitions, mm -hmm. the question that's always in my mind is, Will there be any agencies there? And if there are, how many? Yeah. Because they are very likely to dominate things. Mm. Right. And number two, their domination is almost always an effort to get more clients. Mm -hmm. So their interest, I don't think, is necessarily your interest. Right. So then the first question is, well, why are they there? <laughs> why did you invite them? <laughs> yeah. And so uh, in general, I, I, I try to pretty much get a, a piece of the action distinctively made up of the associations that people belong to and the people who want to come and participate as individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I think the power valence is such that 90% of the time, what you'll end up with is creating a constituency to advocate for and support more services from the agencies. Mm -hmm. So the structure of coalition, I think, is really critical. Mm -hmm. It's just people, people, and the uh, and associations step back when there are paid people who are thought to be experts in the room. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I first learned that the first year I was organizing when I got a bunch of uh, people together in a neighborhood to talk about health, this would have been 1956, right? <laughs> and uh, so it was a very 
interesting meeting. And then uh, I was working very closely with a group of progressive doctors. And I asked one of those doctors to come to the second meeting. And at the second meeting, they didn't talk about any of the things that they had talked about at the first meeting. Oh, wow. The doctor appeared, disease appeared. They began talking about their diabetes, which is very <laughs> common, right? They, now were, the, they, were, they were like getting diagnosed, do you mean? They were like, hey, doctor, yeah, look yeah, at this yeah, thing. Yeah, what is yeah, this? Yeah. We got a lot of people like me who around here got diabetes and having trouble getting this. Or what do you think about that? Well, what, you know, I mean, it's the, so interesting. It just almost, it's so inevitable <laughs> that that kind of uh, discussion will get going. That I learned better. I'd never invite a doctor to a health discussion unless I had to. <laughs> uh, now, the first meeting, uh, I was brand new, but I did ask what I think was the right question. And I said, what is it that you think is around here in the neighborhood and in your lives that makes people healthy? At the end of, let's say, an hour and a half discussion, we had a list. Doctors and hospitals weren't even on the list. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> if you put it that way, people don't tend to think... I think they think that they're about not not what makes people healthy. They're about treating disease. Yeah, it's where you go when you're sick. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, getting getting the right question and the right people, <laughs> so that who's going to be ending up acting is citizens and their associations, and not the. Uh, a group of people who are under the tutelage and control of a doctor yeah. is uh, going to get you a lot closer to help. Yeah. This is really helpful. I mean, part of what we're like growing into now is that we are now moving out of the role of just being organizers ourselves mm -hmm. and into this role of like supervising other organizers. Right. Which we don't really feel like we have enough experience to do but we found there's there here we are and i now from this conversation recognizing all of them the first people they're going to are paid professionals instead of the actual people who they want to help mm -hmm. like um, almost all three of our groups are they're the people who they're initiating conversations with are paid professionals and it's i mean it's just so easy it's so much easier it yes, feels that's like. right. well they're paid they have time to come to meetings i mean yeah, that's exactly. True that <laughs> exactly you don't have to go to them they'll come to you to you know? right yeah yeah mm -hmm. so i think that's an orientation question at the at the beginning who you put together will determine and what question is asked <laughs> will determine where you're going to go right and that's the hidden agenda that's gonna be there. So you got to think ahead, what's gonna happen if we have this, this, and this, and this type of person in the room? Mm. Uh, and if you know your constituency, let's say the individuals, you have a fair relationship to them, What's going to happen if we talk health and we have the hospital there and the clinic there and two doctors there and a public health nurse there, right? Hmm. What's going to happen at that meeting? So Peter Block, who I've worked with a lot, says context is everything. <laughs> two thirds of the questions are answered by, <laughs> by who comes and what the question is, right? Hmm. So uh, that's what I think as organizer, you should be thinking about uh, at, at first. And uh, then when you say you're going to have, thinking about a, a festival, I think that's a, a, a good idea. 
And I think as an organizer, uh, a kind of question you, one of the kind of questions you would be asking is, and then, and then what? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> if, if you get people engaged in then what, right? So they don't think it's just an event and they're done, <laughs> right? You're yeah. building leadership, you know, yeah. so, and then what? And uh, when, um, when you get any clarity about then what, you may be able to see ways that the festival can be used as a launching pad for then what? Yeah. Mm. Mm hmm Because then the goal is not to throw a party. The goal is to build a community that can right. produce something else, yeah. or continue to produce their own good goodwill. Although I think the relationship building is important in and of mm -hmm. itself. I, I would not want to neglect that. The, the uncontrolled new relationships that, uh, that develop. <laughs> right. Yeah, this is helpful. Uh, yeah. Who who would be willing after this to do a, a cooking class? Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, I would. I want to go to that cooking class. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I would too. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe if you have five ethnic groups, you might have five cooking classes as a as a subsequent activity. Or one cooking class that has a different leader every week from five. Yes, yeah. you can go in five yeah, weeks. Go to all five, five right. countries. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I like that. Now, I don't think that's an end in of itself, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> it's a relationship building activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, Elizabeth, you, the other thing that, you've always got to have in your mind is you're watching everything that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're trying to spot people who look like they get the, the general idea and are likely to get other people to join them. Uh, so that every every event, every time you knock on somebody's door, one of the questions in your mind is, is this a person who's a potential connector leader in the future? Mm. Right. Uh, so so that we always say if you go, if you do this door to door uh, gift discovery, mm -hmm. when you leave, you should have three things. <clears throat> the, the first is you know what gifts they have mm -hmm. um, the second thing is you have a relationship with them particularly if you ask at the end or several times would you be willing to share these gifts with other people in the neighborhood because you want the relationship where, right, when you leave, if you reappear with that person, that person knows that they said they would do something in the community to you. Mm -hmm. So all you're doing is you is because you now have a relationship it is a relationship that can lead people to action. Okay. So that's the second thing you have. And the third thing you have is, is this person a person who's a connector, a person who might be in our core group? Should I pay a special attention to this person? Do they have that mentality? <clears throat> because in a way, you good organizers are born not made 
And so you're looking for people who are born <laughs> to do the kind of thing that we want to have done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Outgoing people, you know, positive people. Uh, they, they don't have to be people who are necessarily going to end up at the front of the room giving a speech. <laughs> Not really. Uh, but they're, they're people who other people would relate to quickly, who have that kind of, of sense of, of, of themselves and others that leads to trust. And uh, I don't know where, but in general, I, I would think in a neighborhood, I would want to have a core group. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for the members of the core group. And I'm not so much looking for leaders as I am connectors. Uh, I work with this uh, group in Menasha, Wisconsin. And there's a woman in this neighborhood. Uh, who uh, works from home for an insurance company, right? But uh, who, and, and who's not very, um, it's just sort of self-effacing, not a person you'd necessarily say, why don't you go up there and make a speech, <laughs> right? And uh, in this neighborhood, this neighborhood has 20 blocks and uh, she's visited 800 plus households, finding out what gifts the people have there. She's got a huge uh, list that she use, uses. And uh, did you get uh, Matthew or Adam, did you get my latest, uh, I think it went out this week. Latest learning is 39. Well, I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. You haven't. I thought, I thought I might have gone, gone out well. I mean, it may be there. I just haven't looked at Neither it. Neither of you see Learning 39. The last it's there. I see, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. And look at the second page. Oh, yeah. There's what the right person. <laughs> on. uh, could find. You see that? Mm -hmm. And after each one, it tells how many, it isn't just, but how many people said they would be willing to do that. So she's got this all in her head, right? <laughs> she's got it written down, but mostly it's in her head. So COVID hits about the time she had this half done. And as a result of what she had done, she was able to call on people and put them together in ways that made a very unusual neighborhood response to COVID. It wasn't called that, but a series of activities that kept people from just isolating. And uh, she and Julie Philippeck wrote up a description of all the things that she was able to get done as a connector with that kind of information. And I'm pretty sure it's on our website, uh, maybe under connectors. 
Her name is Vicki Bokelman. Be under publications and then publications by topic. And under topic, I think connectors. Is there is there a topic called connector? Uh, let me look. Let's see, under publications. One of the headings, connectors. Connecting assets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is an article by Philip Peck and Bogleman. Yep. That's it. So you can see what information she got and you can see then in that story what things happened because she had that kind of information that brought that block out, doing things together, but still respecting, you know, the limits. And I think that's a, a useful learning device is to look at the list and look at the story. This is pretty awesome. I mean, it's just it, it just scrolling through it pretty quickly, and there's there's pictures, yeah, in it from the stuff that they were doing, and it is pretty cool to see that yeah. community coming together. Yeah. And they did a fair amount of making sure that everybody had enough to eat. Yeah. Now. I asked Vicki that story after I read it, I said to her, Vicki, how many meetings did you have to make this happen? Uh, and, and obviously I wasn't asking face to face much, but I mean, uh, mm -hmm. meetings uh, on the Zoom. And uh, she thought back, she said, well, why? we did have one. <laughs> so I wrote another learning, which is about, well, what's going on if you don't have meetings and you end up with a story that they've written, how that happened. Mm -hmm. And it shows you the power of having somebody who's a connector. Yeah, cool. she didn't need but, meetings. She just was texting and calling and yeah, right. individuals. And walking up and down the street mm. because she knew everybody in almost every household in every, <laughs> in every street. So people come out, talk to her, right? So presence, and that's one of the things that Ruben's always talking about. Persistent presence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to change the subject just a little bit here, please, John, please, if please. you don't mind. This yeah. has been really helpful, though, and we'll I may even show some of our conversation to our animators through <laughs> from today. So, but the other thing that's come up that we've had an opportunity to explore is a group in Shreveport, Louisiana named Community Renewal. You familiar with them at all? Mac McCarter? That name sounds a little familiar, but I'm not in specific. He said he knew you, but I didn't know if yeah. that meant he'd read your book or if he yeah. knew you personally. Okay. Um, but they are doing community development through relationship they have a we care team where you basically his idea is caring in communities is usually invisible and how do you make it visible mm -hmm. and so he has them fill out a card where you fill out your name and contact information and one way that you care and it could be really anything very low bar yeah you, care, you know just something what are you interested in 
Mm-hmm. And then if you do that, you get a sign that you put in your front yard that says we care. And then all of a sudden this block that you thought nobody's connected, nobody cares. You have a visible <laughs> way of saying now they care there. Yeah. And then from that, we care team, they've recruited basically block connectors or block leaders uh-huh, who, uh-huh. who do get togethers. And they in Shreveport, they have 50,000 people in this we care team. Wow. And they have 1,500 block leaders. Hey, that's great. That's great. And then they've pushed that down into then specific when they need to touch a specific neighborhood that's been hard to infiltrate. They've actually bought homes or actually they build they build the house because they build a, a significantly larger house than maybe that neighborhood usually has. They pay a staff person to live there. And then that person is basically just a community organizer for that neighborhood. Uh-huh. And they've been doing this for like 25 years. And, <laughs> and we, I ended up in Shreveport on a leadership thing I was on and we went and visited their place. And I was like, whoa, this is quite the thing here. And his whole thing is he, he's got his mindset is I want to change society and his definition of society is society is a system of relationships. Mm-hmm. And so he's trying to systemize, systematize how we build relationships that are healthy. Mm-hmm. And so that's those three components of the We Care team, the block connectors, and these little houses that they build. Mm-hmm. We just were curious if you'd heard of them or if you had any thoughts about that model, they would they were interested in partnering with us and wanted yeah. to know if we wanted to basically create a we care team in our neck of the woods um, that would be kind of have a similar impact. So what was his name again? It's Mac McCarter. He's a he's a pastor. I think he was a United Methodist pastor before he did this. Uh-huh. And yeah, you know. If he's been around 25 years, I probably. <laughs> and, and, and you know, when people say that, mostly when I've been in a place, I've been in a place at a meeting with 100, 200, 300 people. <laughs> and, and it's just a little hard for me to keep track of. Them. Yeah. That, that right. sounds just wonderful. Just wonderful. Uh, and the uh, idea of care. Let, let me go back. If you're asking them uh, the care question, what, mm-hmm. can you tell me how the question is asked and one or two examples of how people might answer? Let me see if I can. I'm not, I, I hear. Let me see if I can actually find the, the card. Um, so you do your contact information. And then you say, um, it's actually just, I am helping another by, and mm. then you fill it, fill in your answer. That's it. I'm helping another by. And then they're, they're given the front yard sign. Yeah. So if you're in, if you're in there, you can, anybody can fill it up, but if you're in there, Shreveport, vicinity yeah. then you get you would actually get a sign to do that and you can see i you can share it here with you what it looks like can you see that so this is the that's like a this is the this is the form you can fill it out online here yeah and helping mm-hmm. another buy and then you fill that in and then that's yeah. the sign that they have yeah yeah and it, it is really impressive when i was there in shreveport they took us to a neighborhood and when you drive down a block that has a bunch of those signs on it, I mean, it does feel like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you like, wow, this, I wouldn't right. mind living here, even though, you know, it may not be the most fancy neighborhood or whatever. It's like people yeah. care that matters to me. Yeah. No, I've heard of that off and on uh, mm-hmm. of some way of designating in public the, the, connectivity of people and mm-hmm. uh, sometimes much more specific that 
I'm a member of, of the Jefferson Park Neighborhood Organization uh, to publicize the group itself. Okay. Uh, you know, as many, many people with those kind of signs out right. there as, as possible. Um, yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, that makes me think of somebody else. Uh, and he may, McCarter may know this guy. In fact, I'm going to talk with him at 10.30 this morning. <laughs> There's a guy in Vancouver okay. called Al Etmansky. Uh, he's a member of our faculty a long time. Um, he is, among other things, the inventor of an organization called PLAN, uh, which is associated with the disabilities field. Um, but he and his wife, oh, I'm blocking on her name, starts with a C, <laughs> her first, at any rate, have been long time activists around the idea of care and the mm -hmm. hidden care uh, and have, uh, particularly his wife has been doing a lot of work in fact she created a, a little kind of business around this which i think i can't remember it starts with a t time at any rate uh let me i'll be talking with al at 10 30. and if you'd like to uh i'm sure he'd love to meet with you for an hour and catch you up on what they have done around the idea of care. Yeah. So, uh, and they've been at it for quite a long time. Now, Al comes from the world of disability. He was the director of the British Columbia Disability Association, right? Or whatever it was called. But he became much more bro broadly interested in uh, community life on the connections between people who are labeled and what they could do for themselves. Mm -hmm. and, but, but also how much of what makes it possible for people who are disabled to uh, function is care, not paid care. Mm. Mm. And where is it? And so the discovery and making visible care is very much what he and his wife, oh, I can't. Vicky, it looks like, maybe is that her name, Vicky? Could be, yeah, Vicky Carmack, I think, something like that. So uh, I'll ask him to uh, get in contact with you and, and try to set up a time when a group of you can get together, spend an hour. Oh, man, that'd be great, yeah. He is uh, an amazing person. Uh, he is one of the two or three, I've been all over Canada for years. I spent a third of my life in Canada. <laughs> He's probably one of the two or three most influ influential people in all of Canada. Whoa. Wow. He knows all the people at the top of government in both parties. He, uh, he knows people in uh, every province. Uh, what he developed... <clears throat> this thing called plan is that so many parents he could see uh, uh, people who are labeled dis disabled, many, mm -hmm. one of the mo greatest concerns, and I know this from the people I know, is what's gonna happen to my child when I die? It's you know mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. most common issue, plan, is a way of dealing with that question 
of setting up a structure before, you know, while you're living. Uh, that has uh, a financial uh, benefit to you of setting up a kind of a trust that will ensure that your child has an economic future outside of institutionalization mm. and a set of people who would be moving with that person. And there, there are books about that, but most of it depends on people who will care, who care for somebody else. Yeah. And in that field, they long ago created circles of support, which is six or seven people who join in a group around a disabled person. Not, not every day, but for helping that person become, fulfill their dreams and become part of the community. Mm -hmm. And they have a process in which, in which they can sit down. Uh, they, they get six or seven people who are somehow related person, might be a librarian that knows. <laughs> knows this person that could be mm -hmm. their sister you know, and a process by which they go through getting this person to have a dream for themselves five to 10 years ahead. And then once that dream has become clear to everybody, then the question is, Number one, what can the disabled person do to, to make that dream come true? How can the six of us, what can, with our various talents and contacts, what can we do to abet, foster, provide a platform for the person who's taking primary responsibility into their own future? It's a genius structure. That sounds amazing. Yeah, you can get a lot out of that too. Just the learning, learning about circles of support. And there's a whole books on it, right? <laughs> Guides. And I bet they don't include a doctor in that group of things. <laughs> uh, probably the second I need to talk. Guys. Pardon? The guys are here. Yeah. Um. Are they working? Okay, now I can come out now. I We normally are scheduled for an hour and we run over, but I got just a ride, uh, a crew of guys who are gonna take down two huge dead trees. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm afraid I got to go out there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your, for your time. Oh, listen, I just love this. Just love this. Uh, now, we don't, we make a new time each, each month, right? We set new time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me get my calendar and we'll do that quickly. I'm sorry. I've. We could probably go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. I know, I know I could easily go on forever. But <laughs> probably shouldn't. So. Yeah, right, yeah. Let me see if I can find what I do with my calendar here. It's a second. Yeah, so fast. Like I didn't even answer the call. The first time I just was like, what's that? Oh. And then I was like, oh. oh. Okay, we're the 16th or the 17th Ray. Right. Yeah. So in October, 
Sixteenth uh, is Saturday. Fifteenth is a Friday. Is a Friday a good day? Probably that next week would be better for us. Okay, like starting the nineteenth, maybe, or any time after that Tuesday. That okay. Week. Okay, I could schedule something uh, the 19th, uh, maybe it my, uh, you're on my time, right? Yeah. We are, yeah, central I'm time, yep. Uh, at 11, no, 10 o'clock, I'm going to be talking with Peter Block, so uh, mm. if we... How about 11, 11 o'clock? Yep, that works. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to sign off here real quickly. The telephone treat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, John. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.